Hello and welcome to the Esri GeoDev webinar series. We are continuing this series with another webinar to keep it rolling. We started this series in the hopes that we would be able to continue developer related topics and discussions in between Dev Summits. We hope you get as much or more out of it than you anticipated. Now, we would like to introduce you to today's webinar, Explore the Power of the ArcGIS API for Python. Before we get started, I'd like to get, go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. You're listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. I would now like to introduce Ben Ramseth, instructor with Esri, and Atma Mani, product engineer also with Esri. Ben, let's get started, shall we? Yes, we shall. Thank you, Amy. Oh, yeah, I'm Ben Ramseth, and I'm broadcasting from Charlotte, North Carolina. Welcome, everyone. And uh, you have joined the Explore the Power of the ArcGIS API for Python. So this is going to be about 45 minutes of me talking about the ArcGIS API for Python and what you can do with it. And then it's going to be followed with about a 15-minute session for Q&A, where Atma Mani, the um, product engineer for the ArcGIS API for Python, is going to answer some of the questions that come in. So the topics that we're going to cover um, are what is the ArcGIS API for Python? So maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't. I'm going to explain what it is, and then what can you do with it? And really, that boils down to the functionality, like what functionality and what is possible. Um, what can you get at with the ArcGIS platform using the ArcGIS API for Python? Then the GIS module, which is you'll find is your gateway or pathway into working with your web GIS or working with the ArcGIS platform. And then scripting workflows. There's a number of personas that we have, whether it's org administrators, content publishers, uh, GIS analysts, or potentially the data scientists, uh, and then power users and developers uh, and how they can use the API. And then at the very end, once we talk about it, uh, I'm going to tell you how you get started on your own. There's actually a couple ways you can get started. One is these live notebooks that I want to say right away that is really great. Uh, um, and I'll show that in a demo. And feel free to play around with those as uh, throughout this presentation or after the presentation when you in your office trying out the Python API. So you don't have to do the install to actually play around with the API. So you might ask first, what is the ArcGIS API for Python? You're like, Ben, what is this thing? Well, as the icons say here, you know, basically you're using Python and you're working with the ArcGIS REST API or REST endpoints that are exposed from the ArcGIS platform. And when we talk about the ArcGIS platform, we're talking about the organization, which might be um, a portal with small p is how I, you know, off the cuff say it, um, but ArcGIS Enterprise or ArcGIS Online. You know, either one of those, you're connecting into your web GIS and you're able to script or automate workflows or call all functionality from that WebGIS using Python. So what the development team has done for to create this ArcGIS API for Python is to make a Pythonic GIS API. And this Pythonic G GIS API is set up to correspond to best practice and use standard Python constructs that have data structures that are clean and readable. Um, so you come in knowing, as a Python programmer, that you can get in and easily use ArcGIS and not have to maybe know all the ins and outs of the GIS space to be able to successfully use it because it follows the protocols or the patterns you used to in Python. And the other side of it is folks out there, a lot of you might be already using ArcGIS, the ArcGIS platform uh, or an enterprise user. And for those, we want you to be able to, maybe even without much Python background, be able to jump in and start using this API and successfully automate workflows. And especially for you, where you know they might be falling on the, the side of it, you're going to administrate, administrate your web GIS or you're going to create content. So 
that some of the that are already there and ArcGIS API for Python are two distinct areas. They both both use Python, um, but they're two they they have different um, use cases in in the platform. So ArcPy is what we use with ArcGIS Desktop. So where my cursor is here, you know, you use it to script workflows in ArcGIS Desktop. ArcMat would be at Python 2. ArcGIS Pro is now with a more modern Python 3, but you're mostly doing geoprocessing or some map automation. This talk, we're focusing on the ArcGIS API for Python that is a newer API, a newer um, area that's open that you can script against a portal with a small P there, which would be ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Enterprise. This is the more modern uh, 3x Python. And then analysis, portal admin, uh, content creation, big data analysis. Those are some of the things that you might want to do using the ArcGIS API for Python. So four different personas or you know groups that may work with it. So the deal is with this ArcGIS API for Python is that two people might do very different things with it, and that's perfectly okay. We have our org administrators, we have our content publishers, our GIS analysts and data scientists, and then our power users and developers. And some folks might actually do a little bit in all these personas, why some might be specific in one camp, like an org administrator, to create groups, create users, create roles, and then create some content even. They might do content publishing also and put share that content with a group. Why you might have someone coming from the data scientist side that wants to put some web mapping, or excuse me, mapping, excuse me, into their workflows, some mapping into their workflows, and are familiar with Jupyter Notebooks and really excited about it. And you know they're just on the analysis side, and that's what they want to use. So it just varies on what angle you're coming at from. So let's look at those a little bit. We have the org administrators, um, which I you know, kind of talked about some of the things that would do, like create groups, users, roles, all the things that are button clicking that you want to try to avoid in script. And then content publishing. Pretty obvious, you want to get content up to ArcGIS Online. Sometimes that content might be coming from somewhere else and it's weekly or even daily that you want to create feature layers or publish services that are available. And then we have the analysis portion, whether you're a, a GIS analysis, GIS analyst, excuse me, that's getting into big data uh, geoanalytics or some just interactive exploration, which I'll show you when we get into the Jupyter Notebook environment that provides a very visual environment, especially for doing analysis, um, or spatial analysis and geoprocessing, more of the classic stuff that you could do on the desktop, but maybe you decide that you want to script that uh, in a Jupyter Notebook environment and make it available on the website. And then there's the developers. The developers kind of cut across the whole thing because you might have developers work with any of these areas. And um, the developer is a very uh, par powerful area where it allows a developer to use Python to just get at certain pieces of the platform. For example, if they want to just grab network analysis, the ability to do directions, that's a real powerful thing to just jump in using Python, maybe something they're already using, and grab part of the platform. So let's look at some of these actual tasks that they might do. I mentioned some of these already, but um, populate a portal with users and groups, maybe share content. Also clone portals, so or go from you know staging to development, or excuse me, development to staging, to production. Maybe you have multiple portals and you want to transfer stuff across there. Uh, reassign user content if someone leaves the company or if someone's not using it, but there's content you want to get, you can give it to someone else. Perform comprehensive content search. Uh, determine item relationships and, you know, hey, there's a web map and in that web map I have these feature layers that are connected. So if I delete that you know, feature layer, is it going to affect these different web maps? Uh, and then creating a report of metrics of what's going on within your organization, whether it's ArcGIS Online with credit usage or portal and who's logging in and using it. Automating content creation can be a number of things. Uh, maybe you want to take, you know, 50 shape files and upload them and can, um, turn the, publish them as a feature layer, and you want to do that on off-peak hours. Uh, update tiles and features from a known database. Uh, replicating data across from development or staging into production, 
Uh, and also, this is one that a lot of people um, ask about when I do training on the Python API is, how can I go in and update items with broken service links or tweaking things that need to be changed? Like maybe even you have web applications that are stored in ArcGIS Online, and I want to change the logo or the title or some, or maybe a description, certain things without having to go into each of them individually and updating them. And then as far as the analytics goes, um, you can access the big data tools programmatically through the ArcGIS API for Python. Um, also, um, if there's data scientists out there, uh, or you know GIS analysts, uh, there's lots of rich third-party Python packages for data analysis. And with the Python API, you can integrate those in and use them within the ArcGIS platform and get at all the ArcGIS platform stuff and all this third-party um, packages that have been created by the community. And then also charts, graphs, 2D, 3D maps in this thing called Jupyter Notebook that I'll show you in just a minute. Um, very powerful environment, especially to do this type of analysis. And then you can share your research and data and notes with peers, whether you're sharing a notebook or maybe an HTML of your notebook or a PDF, or maybe you output it as a, a PY or a Python file and give it to someone to run in an IDE like um, WebStorm. WebStorm, excuse me, PyCharm, same company, different product, uh, PyCharm or Spider or any of the IDs that are out there. So let's go back and look at that hex that we have here. So you can see the GIS here, I'll use my cursor, is a big part of the Python API. So that allows you the pathway to connect into it. And what I'm going to show you in just a, a minute, the demo, to do that. But also all these other pieces like geoanalytics, so for big data, geocoding, geoprocessing, working with geometry, doing editing, uh, mapping. Um, so you have a map control about to show you, real-time data, raster, um, working with features individually, like I said, editing or maybe even analysis, like do these two features intersect, uh, network, and also schematics. So there's lots of different modules that make up the Python API, and all that functionality can be used by those different personas. Okay, so time to try it live. Like I said before, the Jupyter Notebook is the preferred IDE or development environment for the Python API, but it's not the only one. You can choose to use any um, Python um, IDEs out there. Uh, you just, the thing is, you won't have the map control that's already been created in the uh, Python API to use. So I'm going to take a look. It's notebooks.esri.com. I'm going to open that up. And this is the uh, Jupyter Notebook environment, and this is actually uh, up on a server. And we have a lot of bandwidth here for people to jump on. So if anybody wants to play around with this while I'm doing this, you're welcome to you know, start your own session and go in and play with these notebooks, notebooks.esri.com. Or like I said, after the talk is a really good time to go in and do it. I'm going to create a brand new one here, a Python 3, and it will open up. And this is the Python environment excuse me, Jupyter Notebook environment. You can also install this locally, which we'll talk about in the end of the talk, but this is a one that's already set up. For those of you that maybe have, are web developers and have used the ArcGIS API for JavaScript, it's similar to the sandbox, um, where you can write code and see the results right away, but different, of course. Like I can do one plus one, and I can push this button here, and that will take me and add that together and give me an output of two. I can also do shift enter. So if I do A as a variable equals one plus one, and then do shift enter on my keyboard, that will also run the cell. And it's really quick. So I don't know if you saw that it turned into a little star when it was running. And then when it's done, it will have, um, it just it puts the number down. And then I can just put in the variable. Whoops, that didn't work for some reason. And then do shift enter again that will return the output. So I can return variables that have something in it just by putting it in a cell and then I see the output. You'll see that's really handy when we get into the GIS stuff. So another thing I was going to do here is just show you just real quickly the um, GIS part of it. And I can do um, a dot tab and that should give me code completion. It might not there it is, it's just slow coming up. Uh, and then there should be one GIS on here. Whoops, it's really going a little slow. Well, it's just typing in. 
and then I'm going to do import and whoops I need to do that next line JS there we go so I'm going to do shift enter on that invalid syntax and that's the thing when I do okay real quick uh, like a cooking show it's good to go in and have a backup plan I'm just going to go grab this under the getting started and I'm just going to grab it right from here and put it back in there yeah there we go let's take care of that error and, it, and actually errors are good to come up because you know there's an issue and then you can fix the issue like invalid syntax do shift enter again now it's running my code and I should have a map show up and just a little FYI the first time that you have a map show up is um, it might take a little bit like a couple seconds but once it shows up it's pretty solid and then now this is an interactive map that I can use I can zoom in and out so real powerful and I'm going to talk more about that later and um, this is actually anonymously logging into ArcGIS Online that's where this data is coming from because we didn't specify any credentials later I'll show you how to log into your own, own organization so I could say that I plan to have that mess up happen with the error and I could say that I didn't but um, it's good to have that you can see errors show up and those errors sometimes tell you exactly what the problem is and then you can move forward as far as troubleshooting goes okay so going back to the slide deck here so try notebooks.esri.com a real low bar way to get into and use the you know low point of entry you don't have to do much you don't have to set anything up you just go in there and play around with it okay so introducing the GIS module I just showed you in that little quick demo that the GIS module you know using it you could see that there's a map but there's more to it so this is your gateway into the scripting environment so it provides it's basically a representation of your web GIS or your portal small p ArcGIS Enterprise or ArcGIS Online um, there's also a sub module that is for ArcGIS server so you can actually directly connect with a sub model to ArcGIS module excuse me to ArcGIS server and get into ArcGIS server and administrate ArcGIS server like start stop services things like that so it's not you don't have it's not just going through ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Enterprise you could go down below to your ArcGIS server that may be connected to your ArcGIS Enterprise um, but groups users roles items you'll access all these things you can search for content the search is a very key thing that's on these manager classes that have the actual methods that are gonna do the operations that you want to do so let's just get right in and do another demo there we go so for this demo I'm gonna jump over here to a pre-done um, code that I have set up I'm going to run the first one here I'm going to do a shift enter and what this will do is it will grab the um, chunk of code to get the GIS module it's importing the GIS module from the Python API and then the next thing here this is how you log into portal so with portal you put in or ArcGIS Enterprise um, the portal for ArcGIS which is part of ArcGIS Enterprise uh, you put in the URL for it and then you put your username and then for the password here I'm using a Python package that's called get pass that allows me to do this I do shift enter and then I can type in my password so my password doesn't have to be exposed and then I would log into ArcGIS Enterprise so now I'm logged in as the portal admin so that's great and basically anything you're going to do between the two the stuff down below that I'm about to do can be done in ArcGIS Enterprise or ArcGIS Online so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to shift over to ArcGIS Online and use that to do the rest of the demo but just know that everything I'm doing in here could be done in either okay so here's a line of code where I'm going to grab me the person that's logged in and put me into a variable and once I do that there I am so there is my user and it gives all the information about that user and a nice little display that you can see it's very interactive I could get call my first name so I could say user and then use the brackets and put in first name that's one way of doing it another way of doing it would be user dot last name or I could say user dot first name also so 
multiple ways that you can attack it. That Pythonic part, it follows you know, best practices. Also, I showed you this briefly before, but if I put a dot and then do tab, I get the code completion. And then I could scroll down and I could choose one of those options to put in. So I have access to all the code completion, so it's easier to write your code. And then also, it's you don't want to, you know, all the typos that can potentially pop up. So really handy. So let me do this. Thought I did that before, just make sure we cleared everything out. Okay, good. Interesting. So I'm gonna do shift enter again, and I'm gonna create the map. So here is a map. This is a live map of New York City here. Um, I've just put in, it has a built-in place uh, finder, so it uses the World Geocoding Service, I believe, to go in and place locate, and now we're located in New York. And then map one is returning the map to the screen, and you can see it. You can also search for content. So this is using the IPython display. So it gives us a nice little thing. If I do um, shift enter here, it's gonna give my content that's available in ArcGIS Online. And the way this is set up is that you can click on this and it'll give you a link into ArcGIS Online. So it goes into my account and goes into you know, what um, information or what uh, content I'm looking at. I'm a big disc golfer, so you can see I've got you know, sample data that deals with disc golf courses in Charlotte. Like, like regular golf, but used with a disc, or a Frisbee, you might call it. Enough of that about disc golf. Let's look at the portal name, which is one of the properties that you can use of our WebGIS. So you can see here, it's ArcGIS Online that we're working with. If you have a custom base URL, you can return that. You can see mine's just the standard. And then also, I can see credits. So I could find, you know, other information about people and what they're using, but here's the total credits available with this organization. Okay, so working with the map. For some reason those maps weren't clearing out, and I don't know why, but we won't worry about it. I'm gonna create a new map here. There we go. So I've created a new New York map, and then I can set a different zoom level. So let's say we wanna zoom out to a certain level. There we go, that's zoom level four based on the base map scales. I can find out what base map I'm using. So you can see here it's topo. I could also change the base map. Dark gray, maybe that's the best one. I can make the, the map control bigger. There I made it 60 pixels. I can zoom to a certain location. So let's, or excuse me, pan to a certain location. I just panned over to Los Angeles. And if we zoom into a level of 12, you'll see that I'm in kind of East LA. Yeah, the East Los Angeles area. I could also zoom back. I'm just gonna use the center command to zoom back to New York City. So we'll scroll up I'm now in New York City. And then I'm going to search my ArcGIS Online I'm gonna add in this layer called police pro, uh, precincts. So it searches it and then, well, it actually doesn't add it in yet. It searches it and this is the array that is being returned. I, it's only one in the array, so I use the index value zero and then I can add it to the map. And there we go, there is some police pro sync, uh, precincts. excuse me. And with these, you can click on them and you can get pop-ups. So you have the pop-up option, you also have the zoom to. So you can see it's an interactive map right here in the Jupyter Notebook, you're able to interact with your data that you have in ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Enterprise, depending on what you're connected to. Okay, so now I'm down under locating address and this is the last one I'm gonna do in this demo. Um, I'm going to import the geocode. So this imports a new module Everything else we've been using, just the GIS module, I'm gonna import the geocode module. I'm gonna create an address for our address where the Esri New York office is. And then I'm just gonna return that just to show you that, oh yes, that address has been added in. And then I'm going to run this line of code 68 where I put that address into the geocode method. And then I also set pop-ups. So this is all just HTML, I've just, uh, define how I want the pop-ups to look, and then I say, okay, let's draw it, and put on that location that I looked for, and then enable the pop-ups. So if we scroll back up here, there is our pin. I can click on it. 
you can see that there's the Esri New York office. It's in Chelsea. Let's just let's just slide over just a little bit there. There we go. And I think one more level in. That's perfect. And notice I click there, and it's actually one out of three because that's the location where I um, looked at or searched on the map. But if I click this, it's actually I've highlighted the police pre precinct. So you can see that actually the office sits almost right between or the edge of two different precincts. So this is precinct 10, 10 or this one over here is precinct, precinct 13. So you can kind of do some visual analysis there, or maybe you're doing this geocoding to start a process of doing some other analysis tools. So here's where I want to click on the map, buffer an area, and then select a bunch of points. There's a lot of different ways this can um, blossom out from this you know, starting location of finding an address. Okay, back into the PowerPoint. So we logged in using some built-in users with ArcGIS Online and ArcGIS Enterprise, but there's lots of different other authentication schemes. Um, and really, um, it's, there's kind of no limit within the, the platform because anything that's supported on the bottom here, it says ArcGIS Pro. Uh, even though ArcGIS Pro is separate than the, the Python ArcGIS API for Python because Pro uses ArcPy and it does different things, but the deal is, is that um, Pro has a log, you log into poor, um, ArcGIS Enterprise, or you log into ArcGIS Online in ArcGIS Pro. So the Python API is smart enough um, using this little Pro keyword that you can grab the authentication from ArcGIS Pro if you want to and bring that in to log in um, to, to the organization, whether it's ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Enterprise. So it's really sweet if you are a Pro user and you want to do that. If you're not, Forget that I said this, it's no big deal. You can use any of the other authentication schemes. Uh, but sometimes you might find an authentication scheme you're using that's not supported directly yet in the ArcGIS API for Python, but it may be supported in Pro. So it's a handy tip to know about. And it's outlined, in, outlined well in the help in the authentication section. Okay, so now getting under the different um, personas, we have the org administrators. And the org administrators is, I think, a really powerful um, section. Um, I worked at the International User Conference last year in San Diego, um, this past year, and or actually this year, excuse me, this year, 2017. I nonstop talked to people about the, the API when I was down in the developer island. And a lot of people that were coming up were GIS analysts or managers or administrators they were like, yeah, you know, I've got some workflows I need to automate. I need some more information about that thing. So I think there's a lot of buy-in in this org administration area, and it's a very powerful area because there's a lot of workflows that maybe some people are using some different types of Python scripts that already exist, but here we have an integrated way with the platform to be able to do it. So I'm gonna show you just a, a small subsection of what's possible in org administration. So jumping back into this same Python notebook, um, here's my org administration section. Um, what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna run this and then explain it. Here I'm creating, uh, worked really fast there, uh, creating a group. Um, so I'm creating this new group called webinar group and setting all its properties all in line and attaching a thumbnail. So if you had to do this over and over or needed to create a bunch of groups, you could script all this out and just run the script and get it to get it to work. Now, in my org here, you'll notice there's no groups yet. I already ran it, so there really is, but you can't see it. If I refresh the browser, you'll see that that group shows up. So I want you to see that this is this is no joke. I'm doing this live, and we're actually altering my organization. This happens to be ArcGIS Online. This could be done the same with uh, um, Portal or with the ArcGIS Enterprise. So I've made a group now um, just by calling that, you know, a couple lines of code. You're basically calling GIS groups create and then putting the parameters in. Now, once it's created, you can see that you can search for it. So there's the one group that was created. And then I could return it back to the Python notebook. And this is also a live link. So I could click on it and go into um, ArcGIS Online and check it out. Also, another thing as an administrator I might want to do is add users to the group. 
So I have some users that are already in the org, but I could also invite users or create users with script. But in this case, I'm going to use the add under bar users method off of group, and I'm gonna add in these three users. Now this is where it gets a little weird sometimes. This is the Pythonic part. Um, when I first started learning this, this confused me because I'm like, okay, great, not added, what does that mean? What it means here is you'll see this in a number of the things is here, not added is the result that you're getting back from the rest endpoint to say that this is an empty string. So you, you, you not added zero people. So that means that everything was successful. It's a little backwards for some folks that maybe are not big Python users, but that's that's the way it's set up. So you've got you know three users you're added. If you get this empty string that says none of them were not added, you're good to go. And that's one of the examples of something you could do with administration. Now there's a lot of other workflows like I talked about earlier. Plus I'm going to show you at the very end we're going to share some content to this group. But before we do that, we actually have to create the content. So let me jump back into the uh, slide deck here and talk about content publishers. So sometimes these content publishers would be the same people that are doing the admin. Other times they might be an organization that's larger. You have multiple people that are going to create content. And I know for all my experience teaching different um, types of you know web development training or administration training for Arches Enterprise um, or Arches Online, is that there is a lot of redundant tasks that you can um, script and make it, you know, free yourself up for time to do the things that you really want to get done and work, put some brain power on. And this content publishing is definitely one of them that it's really handy um, to save, save time on. And not all content, interesting that it didn't clear out, not all content, we'll get rid of those, pretend you didn't see those, um, is owned by the GIS team. So you might have things like a CSV file that you're getting from another organization. Let's say you work for a county and the city is sending you a CSV that has information on it. So in this scenario here, I've got some information from the New York City. We're gonna put in some a CSV file full of like just over a thousand incidents, emergency response incidents. So I'm gonna do a shift enter here. And that's going to upload this thing to ArcGIS Online and set all the properties. So I can properly, all those things that you just want to click through and not set, well, here it kind of forces you, you just you know, put all those things in, you can just have it all scripted out. And let's say that this CSV file comes in every week. So to be able to script this workflow is a lot easier than having to manually upload the CSV files all the time. And then the next thing, I should have done this earlier while I was talking here, uh, I'm going to publish it. So this is gonna take the CSV file, there's an XY location here, it's gonna locate all those locations by their XY coordinate, and then put them into a new hosted feature layer. And just to show you this is actually happening, if I go in the content page, you'll see that the first two ones, uh, we first made a CSV file, that item, and then we've also made an item that's called a feature layer and it's hosted. So this is all going right into my ArcGIS Online. And the star is gone, so that means it is functional. And then if I do this next one here, you can see there it is. I've also included a thumbnail that I specified right up here when I set up um, the, um, the, the CSV item. And then it doesn't stop there. Now that might be all you need to do, and then you, you tell people, hey, it's available. You automate it to send everyone an email that says, hey, this, the data's up, or the data's been updated. Or you can see right in Jupyter Notebooks, I could choose to display it on a map. So here is all my data and it does have pop-ups so I can zoom in and it has all the information coming from that data set. So this is a utility gas main rupture it looks like. And I could zoom into where that was happening. Um, boom, done. You know, went from CSV to be able to interact with it right here in Jupyter Notebook without much time at all. Then another thing we can do is we can actually do rendering. So I'm applying just the default render or heat map, uh, a heat map renderer with kind of the default settings. The only thing I've changed was the opacity. So when I run that line, I'm going to have a new um, map that shows up just to keep it separate so you can see both of them. We could also pop it on the same map. And this is a heat map of all the response incidents. 
you can see it's kind of concentrated because they're only in Manhattan because that's the, the, where the data set's from. But now as I zoom in, you can see that it starts to show up and you are going to start seeing different hotspots. Maybe zoom out just a little bit. And there we go. You can see that there's some definite hotspots for whatever reason, population or maybe what's going on in a certain area, but you're starting to interpret your data. So that can be done in here once you create the content. If you want to look at it, you can start looking at it. That kind of bleeds into you know, GIS analysis and other things that we can do with it right here in Python Notebook. But let's say that you're not interested in this right here. You're just interested in creating the content. That is fine. Um, you can also you know, use other, like I said before, Python IDEs to you know, run this code. And you could maybe create the code to do this, to create the layer here in Jupyter Notebook, and then under the file menu, you can download it as a PY file. And then you could open it up in a Python API, um, IDE, or you could just run it through the command line. So you might find that you maybe make your scripts this way, but then export them out and actually run them automated. The map is nice, and for certain workflows, it's, it's, it's essential. And then other times, especially some of the administration or content creation, you might find that uh, maybe I don't need a map control for this you know, weekly thing that I'm going to run. And then what if you have shapefiles? Shapefiles are the, the data set that will seemingly never go away. Um, if you're going to upload a shapefile, you can do that the same way that you did a CSV file. And then you can see there's the new item. I can then publish it. And the same thing as before, this will take just a second to publish. But you can see up here, I am starting to create that content. So I should see a, there it is, the shape file. And there's my new hosted feature layer. This is some borough um, ba boundaries from New York City. Okay, so it looks like it's all published. I can then search for it like we did before. There it is. I can grab it by its item in the list so it's just one item so it's zero and then i could put it on a map now i didn't make a new map i actually put it on the map up here so if you scroll back up there it is there's all my, the, the boundaries for the different boroughs you know this data for the incidents mainly manhattan but you can see another data set that on top you might notice that i can't really see the points very well anymore so maybe you want to change that well that's definitely a possibility if you're interrogating this data, this last line of code here will add that layer back in. There we go. And now you see it's on top of all the other data. And this is actually an ArcGIS API for JavaScript web control. So this is actually the map control that comes from the, the ArcGIS JavaScript from API that maybe some of you work with and, and you are very familiar with. So the last thing here is share content to groups. So once we have this content created, we could actually call share on those items and then share it to our group. In this case, it's webinar under bar group, and then you share it to its ID. So boom, done. So then that group would be the one that would be able to see the content. Okay. So GIS analysts and data scientists. So moving forward, a couple more things to show you guys before we get to the Q&A session. Um, for GIS analysts, we have a lot of tools in there. There's a lot of tools in the platform. And if it's in the web GIS, you can access it through um, the ArcGIS API for Python. And that uh, includes the possibility of um, geo processing. So you can make your own custom model that wraps up a bunch of different tools. And then you can add it as an item in ArcGIS Enterprise and be able to access it and call it. So there's a lot of possibilities. In addition to that, the other thing is these data scientists, maybe people that are coming outside the, the Esri Enterprise. They haven't used an Esri Enterprise software yet. Or maybe they're an organization that has licenses to the enterprise, um, but they're in a group that you know really hasn't used GIS yet. But they're yet doing... Um, data science and working with all these workflows and they want to integrate some mapping, whether maybe it's a simple display in Jupyter Notebook or maybe they actually want to integrate some of the analysis tools that are available in the ArcGIS platform. Um, this is one thing when I was at the user conference in 2017 this year, um, I had a, a, you know 
many people come up that were coming from the data science world, you know, universities and other organizations that do a lot of data science. And they were so excited about the ArcGIS API for Python. I talked to a guy from Berkeley for a while, and he was just pumped about how much data science is going on in his university. And he's this works great for like the learning setting to have students learn and get excited with it. But it, him and his own research that he's doing, he's like, oh, I'm so thankful that now I can integrate the platform um, using this ArcGIS, the ArcGIS platform in my Jupyter Notebooks and have it pretty streamlined and, and all ready to go. So a lot of excitement there. So there's a lot of possibilities, I think, on the second one here with data scientists. You know, it's in the early stages, but I'm interested to see where it goes. But as far as the, you know, GIS analysts go, I wanna show you one workflow here. There's a number of samples that are in the help, and this is just one of them. Um, this is the California forest fires. Uh, and with all of the samples, there's a try it live button. So you can go in and you can play around with the sample um, and this one's kind of nice, nice one to show off because it, it has the images already in here, so I can just walk through and explain the code to you. Um, but with any of these, you can clear that all out, um, and you can actually run the sample right here in the notebook. Now, not all of them, some of them require some ArcGIS Enterprise because the big data analytics ones, they'll require you running it locally with your ArcGIS Enterprise. But a lot of them, like this one being an example, you can run it right here in the live notebooks. So in order to do this, you can see we're um, installing pandas. Um, we're logging into a, a portal that's available for testing, kind of like some of the sample services that are available with the ArcGIS API for JavaScript. Uh, and then, well, here we're searching for a certain group that has a bunch of content in it. And some of that content is active forest fires, critical infrastructure. I'm going to bump this up one notch. There we go. And um, the infrastructure at risk, which is a web map that I'll actually used to display the results. So for visualizing that, you know, we can create a map. And down below here, we're putting on the fire information, which is these little blue areas, the uh, critical infrastructure, which is the orange. And then we also connect into that web map to have our final results. So here what we're doing is doing a buffer of four miles around the fire boundary to figure out what of these critical infrastructure infrastructures could be at risk depending on you know where the wind's going and what the conditions are like. And I know some of you, I mean, probably everyone has heard about what's been going on with California in the Central Valley um, or, you know, the, um, not Southern California, like you see here, but farther north, um, you know, huge neighborhoods have been taken off. And, and, you know, these aren't just like a couple houses out there. We're talking neighborhoods that were fairly affluent neighborhoods been taken out by fires. So you notice that it's a very timely thing. So doing this analysis, we're finding out what things we might want need to protect or maybe cut down and remove some vegetation or make sure that we can do some type of, you know, plan to remediate the risk in these areas. So then we're buffering, and this is a point in polygon analysis where we're taking those buffers and then selecting the amount of points that fall within those buffers. So here's the example of creating the buffers. So you can call all these methods. You know, it's all available to you know grab points and then buffer those points. And then we do an overlay. So here we're overlaying the fire buffers with the infrastructures and getting a result. And then once we have that result, we could put it in a pandas data frame. So this is just a screenshot of the pandas data frame showing the data. So it's in a readable format that we can say, okay, we got power plants, we got hospitals, we got airports, you know, finding what potentially is at risk. And then we can do it and simplify it and put it into something that's a little more readable because there's all this data, but maybe we just need these three fields or four fields that we have here. So making it a little bit more re readable and then exporting it out to CSV. So then we send it to someone that works with Excel and wants to see it in that format. So very powerful to be able to do this analysis, manipulate it and then share it. And then mapping what those critical infrastructures are. There's the places that are at risk. And here's the final web map down here that has nice little icons and showing like, you know, seriously, this is what we need to look at. This is what we need to remediate. 
So that's an example of a GIS, of some, you know, point in polygon kind of analysis. But there's a number of other samples out there that I recommend you guys take a look at, or you know, think about your own analysis and what you might want to start plugging into the ArcGIS API for Python. And then an, another thing that people ask me is like, well, when would I do this over working with um, ArcPy? And with doing analysis, it's really up to you whether you want to do it on the web GIS side or if you want to do it on the desktop side. You do, you know, this analysis could be done in either place. Okay, power users and developers, we're getting short on time. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go in here, um, show this Jupyter dashboard just to show some of the options that are available. This is one of the samples. Uh, I'm just going to run it right away because this one's good to run all, and I'll show you why. Um, run all, there we go. So I'm running all of these, um, doesn't take very long, all these cells for this uh, code. And what this is doing is actually making a dashboard. So you can have a user interface dashboard that you could share this with someone. And this is change detection in India. And we could change this to wherever we want, a different city, since we're doing New York. Um, let's do this and do go. We can go into New York City and we can keep it the same. It'll just detect changes. So it gives you, you actually can do like a web interface for people that you could expose and have them um, be able to manipulate and work with change detection, for example. So as a developer, that's one thing you do. Uh, one other thing that I'm going to talk about is I do a lot of hackathons, and I've found that you know if people want to, developers get into a certain piece of the platform, they might want to go in and grab, let's say, um, uh, directions, and all they care about is getting directions. I had one person come up to me and say, I want to grab directions so I can, on the Python server side, get those directions ready and send it via SMS down to a phone because I don't want, it's in an area that we don't necessarily have good cell service. So we can do it SMS, but we might not be able to use the data package. So the Python API could allow the connection to go into the platform, get at that directions or routing or drive time analysis, and then do whatever they want in their apps. So it can be a real powerful way to go in and grab what you need. Okay back in here so almost there so installing the api it's installed with conda and conda um, comes with arcgis pro so even though this is separate this api is separate from pro conda comes with pro because it uses it with arcpy and what's in pro so if you're a gis person that already has pro installed you can just use the installation of a pro to download the api and install it on your machine and then use it through jupyter notebook so the pro it's it's a little confusing for some people getting started, but it's a convenience thing where Conda is built in, which is a package management management system, into Pro. So you can use that to get the API. If you don't have Pro, no problem, because you can just install Anaconda, which is the full package Python package management system, which allows you to grab the ArcGIS API from the internet, bring it out, and install it. And there's good instructions on the help menu on how to do that. And then you can go in and test your install, make sure it works. Then you can start copy and pasting stuff out of the help and get a start and get a feel for it. So real easy to get roll going. You don't have to do this to start, though. Remember the notebook, um, notebooks.esri.com. That is a great place to start because that's a live infrastructure that you can use um, without having to install it. And check out the online documentation. There's lots of good things in there, like the API reference, all the samples, you can download it. There's also guide topics that a lot of the code that I used in the demos comes out of. So really check out that online documentation. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the presentation part. Now we wanna shift over to Atma Mani, and he's gonna field some of the questions that have been coming in. Take it away, Atma. Uh, thank you, Ben. We're going to now begin with Atma answering the questions submitted during today's presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. If your question does not get answered during our recorded session here, there will be a blog post um, later published that will have your questions as well as the answers, and there will be um, promotion to um, lead you to that blog post. Um, our first question for today for Atma, can you rename map layers in web maps? 
Hey, Amy, Ben, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Can you, the question is, can you rename map layers in web map? Well, you can. You can use the um, web, web map class and read the maps definition, and you could uh, change and call the update method, and that way you can change the name of a layer on a web map. Perfect. The next question is, is it possible to use the Python API as part of a published custom geoprocessing service on an ArcGIS server? Well, to publish a geoprocessing service, you would need to use um, ArcPy. But, so this is a beautiful place where you could use both ArcPy and RGS Python API in conjunction. You could use ArcPy to write your custom script and publish that as a geoprocessing service. And then you can use RGS Python API to consume that service in your scripts or in your Jupyter notebooks and make use of it. Perfect. How are the features set for ArcGIS Python compared to ArcGIS for JavaScript? What important capabilities that are not available in the JavaScript API and ver vice versa? Okay, that's, an, that's a really nice question. Um, the feature set construct is analogous, but uh, when you're using, when you're reading, creating a feature layer and you get a feature set in Python API, you can quickly visualize that as as a, as a spatial layer on a map, as well as as a table um, using the pandas data frame. So on a feature set object, when you call the df property, you get back a pandas data frame that shows you uh, the non-spatial um, attribute columns. And this is also a conduit for you to take the data that you query from a feature layer, and you can take it and make it available for any other third-party um, data analysis library. You could; Those are the new things and highly uh, powerful capabilities that you get out of Python API that you would normally not have in JavaScript. Excellent. If I'm working on ArcGIS Enterprise on-premises without internet or Jupyter, can I test basic functions of Python API directly in any Python IDE? Yes, you can. Uh, you do not need to have internet connection as long as you have a web GIS that is up and running in your disconnected environment. The Python API, you could use the Python API to connect to your GIS and do all administrative or data analysis tasks. When you show us how to connect to portal, can you talk a little bit about how to generate a token for ArcGIS Online for organizations with enterprise logins? Yes. So working with enterprise logins is a little different because each organization may have implemented it in a different fashion and depending on their security mechanisms and security needs. So the way I would answer this is to ask the user to go to developers.rgs.com forward slash Python, head over to the guide and expand this chapter, working with different authentication schemes. And then now we have an array of different schemes and that can that are supported through Python. And also I would like to add that if you have a scheme that doesn't work, then try this mechanism. Connect to it using RGS Pro. Um, with RGS Pro, you can easily install Python API. And when you power them up, you get both ArcPy and RGS Python API. And the way you would use is have RGS Pro running, connect to your organization, uh, your web GIS through Pro. And in the Python API, when you create a GIS connection, just specify the magic string Pro. And we would go and connect using Pro's connection. So that's an easy way. It's, it's, it's like a bridge connection where you use Pro as a bridge uh, to let Python API connect to your web GIS with enterprise security. Thank you. Can you use ArcGIS server map service? Yes, you can. Um, so for, to show that, let me head over to our API reference. And once you are in this website, you can easily get to the API reference by going to, by clicking on this link. Um, so when you head over there, let me go back and show you. Um, it's under the ArcGIS mapping module. You have a map image layer and you have a map image layer manager classes. Using these two, you can consume a map service that is published on an RGS server. Thank you. How are the maps displayed when you're using an environment other than Jupyter? Well, the maps can only be displayed at this point using Jupyter. If you are using a headless environment like a Python script, 
you can still create a map view widget, but you cannot display it. Um, there are a number of different um, environments similar to Jupyter, but officially we only support the Jupyter notebook. Are you using Anaconda? Do you recommend using Anaconda Python? That's a good question. I would recommend using Anaconda Python because it is platform independent. You can get it on Mac, Windows, as well as Linux, and it is free of cost. The other advantage is that when you use Anaconda, you can set up a number of different environments, uh, and you can segregate different projects in different environments. And the best of all is that you get hundreds of third-party Python libraries that you can make use of. Having said that, if you had RGIS Pro, you already have a version of Anaconda in your Pro. So you could use that and install Python API or any other library that you wish. Does the geocoding option allow for the use of custom locators similar to how you can bring one into ArcMap? Yes, you can. When you are using the geocoding module, you can first connect to your geocoding service as a geocoder object and pass it as a parameter to your geocoding function, and we will use your custom geocoder and not that by default comes with your RGS online org or your WebGIS. If I want to use my own raster files for processing in Jupyter, what is the storage capacity of ArcGIS Online? Hmm. RGS Online at this point does not have support for publishing imagery layers. So you would have to have an RGS Enterprise and publish your imagery layers, but you could share them as an item on RGS Online and you can make use of it through your online connection. That would be the way I would recommend. Could you configure your portal from the ground up? If yes, what about setting up the web adapter? Or can the API be used only after you've set up your organization? That's another question. That's a really good question. Um, generally, the pattern I would recommend is to use the Python API after your WebGIS has been configured. Uh, if you're looking at solution to automate setting up your WebGIS, then you will have to take a look at uh, some of the technologies like RGS Chef cookbooks, um, which allow you to automate configuring and setting up your full stack of WebGIS. Typically, we have seen users where they would use Python API with the Chef cookbooks in conjunction, and they can very easily in a few commands and also in a headless environment, go and set up a full stack of our WebGIS configured with users groups, content, and even styling their WebGIS. Can you use the custom pop-up features with HTML tags using this Python API? Um, at this point, we don't have support for custom HTML tags, uh, I mean, sorry, custom pop-ups, but we are looking into it for future. Is there a layout that splits maps on one side of the screen and code on the other? Uh, that's another interesting question. Well, Jupyter Notebook at this point has, uh, an, uh, has an IDE where you have map and you have code beneath it, or each are in individual cells. Uh, but we're also exploring a new project from Jupyter called Jupyter Lab, which allows you to customize these widgets in any fashion that you would like. So at this point, no, but maybe in future we are evaluating um, the Jupyter, Jupyter Lab environment. What level of access in ArcGIS Online is needed to run Python scripts to create groups and publish and share a layer? That's a good question. You would need the same same kind of credentials you would need to normally use a user interface and create groups or publish layers. So you would need a publisher privilege um, to create new web layers. And depending on how your org is set up, and by default, uh, even as a user, you can go and create um, new groups. But your organization could have custom roles where the administrator could have defined these capabilities or these privileges in a granular manner. So you would have to check with your administrator in those cases. But the general pattern is that whatever privilege you need using the user interface, that's the same privilege you need when you're using the Python API. Perfect. Can you create code to access date from SQL database using Python? That's an interesting question. Um, 
so the user asked, could you use that using Python? So I'm going to hang on to that verbatim and say that the pattern I would recommend is you use pandas um, as a data analysis library to connect to your database. Use pandas to connect to your database, get the data through pandas as a data frame. And then if you want to combine that with any of your GIS layer, or if you want to publish that as another GIS layer, you can easily do that using the Python API. What libraries can you import into Jupyter Notebooks? Standard Python libraries? Any installed on the local machine? That's a good question, too. You could import any standard libraries as well as anything installed on your computer. But having said that, there is a caveat. When you're starting the Jupyter Notebook through Anaconda, it starts using the environment that you have active. So any libraries that are installed in that environment can be imported in the Jupyter Notebook. So you have to be careful about which environment you're starting. Uh, by default, if you do not create any other environment, you would be using something called as the root environment. That root environment has hundreds of third-party libraries. So in that case, you can pretty much import any library you have in your root in your Jupyter Notebook. Can you use the API to set scale levels in a web map? You can, yes, but you would have to know exactly how to set the scales. At the version that is currently released, we do not have support for doing these in a native manner using the Python API. However, you can read the definition of the web map um, into a dictionary, make the changes to your scales, and then use the update method on the web map object to change the web map on your GIS. Then you should see the changes reflected. And finally, with our last question, is Jupyter part of Esri or a separate initiative? Jupyter is not part of Esri. It's an open source project from uh, Berkeley. Um, it's an open source project that we are making use of for the Python API. We have customized it and extended it a little bit, so you would get the map widget and the nice features uh, that you saw when Ben demonstrated earlier today. All right, thank you, Atma, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar, Explore the Power of the ArcGIS API for Python. If you have any other questions, please feel free to contact me using the email address in your follow-up email. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would greatly appreciate it if you would complete that and provide your feedback. We will be providing a recording of this presentation, which will be available within 7 to 10 business days. On behalf of Esri and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.